All right, so welcome everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around our presentation room. Please note that we've now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are being recorded. Either above or below the main presentation window, you should find a set of icons. The speech bubble will open the chat after the presentation. We'll open up the discussion for questions, but you are, of course, welcome to use the chat throughout. The face with the hand will allow you to raise your hand for questions, including asking to use the microphone in the Q&A or to give simple reactions along the way. A full recording will be posted later today at cideresearch.ca, where we're gradually building up a full archive of almost 20 years of CIDR sessions. If you have research you would like to share with the CIDR audience, we'd be happy to have you aboard. Visit our site for more information and to contact me. You'll also find a description there of our first session for the 2024-25 season with Dr. Rory McGreal discussing micro-credentials and how they can be supported through blockchain and artificial intelligence coming up on September 11th. And here we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a session of our CIDR session series from the Canadian Initiative for Distance Education in partnership with the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning and the Centre for Distance Education Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at Athabasca University. For today's session, we're pleased to welcome back two of our most consistent supporters of CIDR, Drs. Michael Barber and Randy Labont with their latest installment of their ongoing mini-series of State of the Nation reports on Canadian K-12 online learning. Dr. Michael Barber is Director of Faculty Development and Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Touro University, California. He has been involved with K-12 online and blended learning in a variety of countries for two decades as a researcher, teacher, course designer, and administrator. Dr. Randy Labont is the CEO of Can e Learn, a not-for-profit society promoting student success and providing leadership in online and blended learning, and adjunct professor at Vancouver Island University in online learning and teaching for K-12 educators. Together, they are researchers and advocates for policies designed to promote effective K-12 online and blended learning with a particular interest in rural and remote learners, a passion that has now carried their State of the Nation series of reports into its 16th year. So I'm now passing the microphone to Randy and Michael. Everyone, welcome Drs. Michael Barber and Randy Labonte. Hey there, folks. Hi. Um, so as Dan mentions, um, I'm Mike Barber and my colleague here is Randy Labonte and we've got a small audience here. So while I do have some slides, um, basically I'll start with them and, and um, feel free to, to jump in with questions as we're going. And if we uh, end up going completely, um, you know, one way or the other, that's perfectly uh, fine with us. We're uh, while we're prepared to, to talk for a while, we're also prepared to converse for a while as well and prefer the latter, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, so just to give you a, a little bit of an overview. So the, the report each year is uh, sponsored by uh, a number of different online learning providers as well as stakeholders within the field. And um, I'd be remiss each time when I do this if I didn't sort of mention uh, who those folks were, because um, if you caught some of the conversation that we were having uh, as folks were joining, um, it's with thanks to these people or because of these people or the fault of these people, depending upon how you look at it, that we continue to do this every single year. Um, and um, and when I say every single year, I, I do mean every single year. The uh, one that we uh, released back in the end of 2023, so the 2023 edition, was actually the 16th edition of these that we've done. Uh, and we've already committed to a 17th edition and um, have started to get some of those sponsors back again, as well as a couple of new folks involved. Um, 
So if you're not familiar with the, the, the project or uh, you haven't been there in a while, uh, this is the website, and I'm sure Randy can drop it in the chat there for the, the project, and it contains all of the uh, reports that we've had over the years there, so you can get all 16 of those um, regular ones as well as, um, and that screenshot apparently is quite old because apparently we had just released the 2020 report when I took that screenshot, or at least it was four or five blog entries before um, I took that screenshot. Um, it contains all of the, the 16 annual reports that we've got there. I think we've got about a half dozen special topic reports uh, that we have available. And you can see the way the, the website is organized. Uh, if you click on the data and information tab, it actually gives it to you by jurisdiction. So if there's only a specific province or territory that you're interested in, you can actually go and look at how that province or territory has changed over time without having to worry about all of the other ones or without having to open up 16 different PDF documents that you've got to then find, say, the Alberta profile for and look to see uh, how Alberta has changed each of those years. Um, so in terms of how we go about collecting the data each time, um, Basically, the, the main source of information that we've had historically has been uh, a survey that we send to the ministries of education uh, in each of the, the jurisdictions. And then based upon the response we get from them, uh, in some cases we do uh, uh, follow-ups with them, either interviews or, or surveys, uh, we always look at any documents or other publicly available information that they've got. And then because there's often a difference between what the ministry expects is happening or wants to be happening um, and what is actually happening on the ground in terms of how individual schools and school districts and boards are operationalizing things. Uh, we make sure that we reach out to key stakeholders that we have in each of the jurisdictions. Uh, many of these have been developed over the, the 16 years that We've had the project, although the uh, introduction of the Canadian e-learning network about, uh, I guess, a decade ago now, a little bit better than a decade ago, has helped us expand that that network of key stakeholders. Uh, the other thing that we do is we try to send out an individual program survey to every single provider of distance learning at the K-12 level um, across the country. And that gets a little bit unwieldy uh, in recent years as we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of programs in Ontario. Uh, historically, prior to that, that dramatic increase in private programs, uh, we would get usually about a 15 to 25 percent response rate each year. Um, we have heard from just over half of the online or distance programs throughout the country. Up until that that major growth with online providers, uh, private providers in Ontario. Now that we've added, I guess it's about 500 of those folks. Um, our statistics in terms of the total number of programs we've heard from, as well as the ones we've heard from annually, uh, have decreased significantly. Um, so if you look at sort of the, the the data collection over the last couple of years, there are a couple of trends just in terms of our data collection. Um, one is which you'll notice is that um, we're getting a lot more jurisdictions where we're not getting complete data from or the data that they're providing is from earlier years. So they're not able to provide us from the most recent school year. Uh, the best example of this I have is, is Ontario and you'll see Ontario is shaded the entire time um, because Ontario um, the way in which they certify their numbers uh, around this time of the year, actually, usually it's around uh, April um, of each year, they certify the enrollment for not the current school year, not the previous school year, but the school year before that. So as an example, the data that would be confirmed right about now or about a month ago um, would have been for not the 2022-23 school year, which is the most recent one that's been completed, but it would have been for the 21-22 school year. Uh, so the data that we present for Ontario every year is usually about um, two school years old. Um, other jurisdictions, um, you'll note that like Alberta, uh, I'll point out 
um, have the the Ministry of Education under the current regime uh, has stopped um, approving the release of information, uh, whereas previous regimes and, and I say regimes because it isn't necessarily governments because the same political party has been in power now for a number of years in in Alberta, uh, but the change in leadership of that party has changed uh, whether or not we've gotten a response. Um, and similarly with with Quebec, uh, they've been sort of all over the place in terms of uh, their responses because they don't track it at the ministry level and what they do track. Um, they ha have varying definitions of what they consider distance and what they don't, and their definitions internally oftentimes don't line up with the definitions that we are using, or for that matter, the definitions that would be commonly accepted by anybody who would be at a uh, CIDR session or involved in CIDR in any sort of way, or for that matter, distance education across the country in any sort of way. Um, so that's sort of a lot of background in terms of the actual study. Um, you'll see that from a regulatory standpoint, um, most provinces tend to be regulated through legislation, although in most cases that legislation usually is a single clause in the Education or Schools Act that says that the minister shall have the ability to regulate distance learning. And that's about it. Um, the only places where that's really different uh, is in Nova Scotia and in British Columbia, although that's also changing a little bit. Uh, Saskatchewan has, has got some new legislative language around the provincial crown corporation that they set up to manage province-wide distance learning. Uh, but in the case of BC, it's always been both in the Schools Act and in the Independent Schools Act, there's been a significant amount of, of legislative language around what was distributed learning is now, uh, they use the term online learning has been adopted. Um, and um, in the case of Nova Scotia, it's coming out of the collective agreement, which is a piece of legislation that's passed uh, by the legislator. Um, in most instances, it's the actual regulation or the crux of the regulation either comes in the form of a policy handbook or agreements that the Ministry of Education sign with individual providers of distance learning. And if you look at the ticks in those two categories, you'll know that that accounts for about half, maybe a little bit better than the number of provinces that we have, which basically suggests that about a third to half of the provinces have little to no regulation around uh, distance learning other than a single sentence that says the minister shall uh, regulate distance learning. <laughs> In terms of the types of programs, um, this is a, a chart that or a map that we've used since the project first began, um, which sort of designates provinces that have single uh, province wide programs and those that have uh, primarily district based programs and then those that have some combination of the two, as well as those jurisdictions where they rely upon um, uh, programming from outside of their jurisdiction. Um, you'll notice that the two territories that are red as well as Prince Edward Island, although it doesn't show up as well as on Prince Edward Island, are kind of striped, which basically means that while they do have um, single province or territory wide programs, that uh, they also rely upon programming from other jurisdictions. In the case of PEI, it's primarily New Brunswick. Uh, the case of the Northwest Territories, it's primarily Alberta. And the case of the Yukon, it's primarily British Columbia. Um, those jurisdictions have been growing their own internal programs for some time, and uh, it's only a matter of time before they would be solidly red as opposed to striped red. Having said that, and, and we note this in this year's report, the distinction between the two shades of blue or the blue and the purple, uh, depending upon what your screen contrast looked like, um, is sort of blurring. Uh, so most of those that fall into the one of those two categories, and I'll go back to them here. Um, so if we look at, at British Columbia, um, up until this point, and this will change a little bit with now that the new legislation has been fully implemented. Uh, so in the 24 report, it'll change. But as of the 23 report, um, regardless if you had been designated as a newly minted provincial online school or a district online school, um, 
uh, the because that regulation hadn't been in uh, hadn't been implemented as of the 2022-23 school year, um, pretty much any school in the province that was designated as an online school had the ability to operate at a provincial level. Um, so while that's purple, if we go next door to Alberta, um, Alberta is blue, which is primarily district based, but the vast majority of those district based programs also operated at a provincial level. In fact, the way the funding um, mechanism works in Alberta, they're encouraged to operate at a provincial level uh, because that's where they can increase their funding the most. Uh, the same thing with Ontario. While Ontario has a province-wide program in the Independent Learning Centre uh, that's run by TVO, um, they also have numerous district-based programs. And um, those district-based programs through cooperation agreements that they have, have set up these consortiums that essentially effectively make them province-wide in terms of the scope of their operation. Um, so the the distinction between uh, pretty much, really, if we were to look from Ontario going completely west, um, so in all five of those jurisdictions, uh, the distinction between what is province-wide and what is district-based uh, has blurred considerably, although we'll get some clarity around it in British Columbia in the next report. Um, because of that, one of the things that we've thought to do is look at other ways in which we've done, we could designate this. So in the case of um, our colleagues down south, uh, historically, they would do things based upon whether or not they were uh, fully online or supplemental. Um, then they came up with this nice little chart that looks at the dimensions of online programming and trying to categorize programs based upon these um, roughly nine or ten dimensions that they've got. Um, lately, they've actually moved into a, a more visual kind of, of option that they've got here. Um, and um, I, I like the availability of info and rating those just because I like the ability to um, indicate which ministries and, and which jurisdictions are good with providing information and which aren't. I'm not sure how well they would like that and whether or not that would impact their level of participation going forward. Um, but that little availability of info up in the top right hand corner does appeal to me a little bit. I have to be honest, but uh, whether or not we go that way and then um, what they're doing now with their snapshots is that instead of looking at it on a state by state basis, they've started to look at it based upon the type of programming that's available and then trying to write a national description around that. Um, which, you know, if they're able to do with 50 jurisdictions, you would assume that we would be able to do with 15 jurisdictions. Uh, so whether or not uh, this particular chart uh, lives into the 2024 report, uh, we'll see. Um, personally, I kind of like one of these two models or some combination of these two. Uh, but if you guys as consumers of this report have opinions on any of that, we would welcome that. And we've also you know, asked our sponsors and other stakeholders um, their ideas on it. In terms of, of activity, if you look at what's been happening across the country, uh, so this is for the most recent report, the 22-23 school year. Um, and you can see, depending on the jurisdiction, some jurisdictions are quite active in this space and other jurisdictions, not so much. Um, nationally, we're looking at about six and a half percent of students. Uh, obviously, that's an approximation. Um, and while we put the approximation there for some of them, which gives us a sense of our confidence with the data. In all honesty, with in terms of the enrolled in distance or online learning column, uh, we could put an approximate uh, the tilde there for all of those, because even in jurisdictions where um, the ministry thinks the number is fairly firm, uh, there's probably a lot of activity that the ministry isn't aware of. And in some jurisdictions, that's, that's quite common. Um, if you look at this over an annual standpoint, you can see that the proportion of activity has been growing steadily uh, since we first started tracking this. And, and the first data that we have from this isn't even our data. It was a, a survey that was done by the Canadian Teachers Federation back in 2000. Um, and if you take out the 2020 
2020, 21, and the 21, 22 years, and you actually plot these on a chart, it, it comes out with a fairly nice line. Um, those two sort of pandemic influenced years obviously skewed the numbers significantly higher, um, but the rest of them actually work out uh, on, uh, I've charted them in Excel, and they, they come out on a nice straight line uh, that sees a, a reasonable trajectory that's happening there. Um, in terms of if you look at what that looks at on a province by province basis, uh, you get these kinds of numbers. So you can see that, again, if you were to um, kind of exclude the 2020-21 and the 21-22, in most jurisdictions, it's got that nice little flow up. Uh, those jurisdictions where we've got low numbers in general, uh, it's tended to be fairly flat in nature. Uh, so particularly if you look at Atlantic Canada, again, if you get rid of the um, the two pandemic years, uh, New Brunswick is the only place where we've seen any sort of significant uh, change. Uh, the rest of all stayed relatively stable. Uh, the same thing with Quebec, uh, again, relative stability. Um, because we're just guessing at numbers. Uh, the increase we're seeing in Ontario is likely due to the online learning requirement that was introduced, I guess it's four years ago now. Um, even Manitoba is actually, and, and Saskatchewan, those numbers have remained relatively flat or have actually decreased. Um, the case of Alberta, you'll see there's actually a decrease in numbers, but we suspect that has more to do with the fact that we're estimating numbers uh, because the ministry has stopped participating. Um, and again, looking at British Columbia, it's been in the high 60s. And if we were to go back to 2017-18 and 2016-17, uh, it would be the mid to high 60s pretty much that entire time. Um, looking at the proportions, again, you're seeing the same kinds of consistency in terms of proportionally the number of students. Uh, we've got jurisdictions like um, Alberta and British Columbia, and to a lesser extent Saskatchewan, that typically are higher than the national average. Uh, places like New Brunswick and Ontario um, that are close to the national average, and then the rest of the country, in many cases, far below the national average uh, for what we're seeing. The one area that we've seen growth, in, and I've alluded to this when I was talking about the individual program survey, is the number of programs that we've got. And this is something that we didn't track up until, I guess, a couple of years ago in terms of a formal statistic. Um, it was um, in 2020-21 uh, was when the um, online learning requirement uh, was introduced uh, into the uh, context in Ontario. And you can see we went from having about 70 um, online programs there, and that represented about 10 to a dozen private online providers to all of a sudden having about 250 of them and now having over 500 of them. And that growth has been completely with online schools that are either completely, or sorry, private schools that are either completely online or that provide an online option. Um, so the number of public options available in that 248 and that 570 or that 527 uh, have remained the exact same. Uh, so it's only the private programs that have uh, increased. Uh, the number fluctuating in Quebec is also worth mentioning. Um, the difference is, again, depending upon um, Quebec has a number of these um, what they call distance learning um, pilot programs that they started introducing in the 21-22 school year. Um, now, when you look at how they define them, whether they are distance programs or whether they are examples of blended learning or just good technology integration and whether or not you consider blended learning good technology integration is also, I guess, something we could debate or discuss. Um, but um, um, that number that you see in 21-22 in theory accommodates those programs. As we've looked a little bit more closely at what those programs are doing, we're not sure whether or not they are actually distance programs at all. Uh, so when we looked at the most recent school year, uh, we decided to just include the ones we knew were distance learning programs. Uh, 
Um, the only other one that's seen much in the way of change, you can see a bit of growth in Alberta historically, but not this recent year. The same thing with Saskatchewan, a bit of growth historically happening in Saskatchewan, but not with the most recent school year. Um, I mentioned about blended learning. We used to try to figure out the numbers around that. Um, and about five years ago, just gave up on it because um, A, the numbers were completely unreliable. You see there's an asterisk by just about every single number that's up there. Actually, I think every single number. Um, and beyond that, um, whether or not the enrollment was actually resulting in blended learning, um, debates around whether or not blended learning was something that was distinct from just good technology integration and how you defined that um, led us to essentially remove this from our um, use. Uh, since we're just getting out of the pandemic, it is worth mentioning that while it wasn't part of the State of the Nation studies, uh, or at least the final five of them six of them weren't, uh, the first one in gray was, um, the Canadian e-learning network uh, had a study uh, that went on for three years looking at remote learning. Uh, and the distinction between remote learning and, and online learning is important to note here because the state of the nation studies only focus upon distance and online learning. So those established planned programs. Um, we weren't looking at trying to uh, quantify or describe or um, discuss the emergency based pandemic induced remote learning that was happening uh, throughout the country. And uh, but this particular project was so if that's something you're interested in, uh, you can pop over there and I think Randy can drop those links into the chat. Um, oops, I skipped the. So I I'm guess gonna, to, we're going to jump in and make a comment about uh, remote learning, but also the blended is that uh, typically in education K to 12 uh, as well. Um, there's a lot of acronyms that uh, do pop up and are created. Uh, there's a term now that's describing blended learning, not in that as blended, but more in flex. So flexible learning now has been applied into a lot of classroom contexts where students don't necessarily are sitting in the classroom full time. Uh, there's some time when they're spent outside of the classroom, working from home in a community, et cetera. So uh, it's 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 really it would be difficult to measure all of that substantially, uh, but indicating whether or not they're actually registered or enrolled in a brick and mortar school versus into an online only school. That's about the only metric that we have. But even the online schools have some level of attendance required for students. So. Is that blended or is that online? Difficult to say. Plus, in all honesty, I would personally argue that blended learning was a just a, a concept that many um, ideologically based advocates as well as educational technologies came up with as a way to hawk their wares within the K-12 system. And really, if you look at the way blended learning is defined, um, pick up any textbook about technology integration from the 1980s, and you'd see the exact same verbiage being used to describe what we have been calling technology integration since, you know, the advent of technology being used in schools. Um, so I guess to, to clue up the slide, since no one else interrupted me and I didn't see anything coming through in the chat, um, in terms of some general trends that we've seen, um, 2022-23 was really the first year that we've seen sort of a, a return to pre-pandemic kinds of levels in terms of growth, activity, um, interest, regulation. So uh, we're somewhat confident in saying that we're entering or have entered what will be the new normal phase for distance and online learning across the country. Um, that new normal means that at least there seems to be a, a greater awareness of what uh, distance learning is, although unfortunately that doesn't necessarily translate into a greater level of knowledge and that confounding between distance and online learning with remote learning is um, you know, still quite uh, present within many of the policymakers and policy decisions that are happening throughout the country. Um, 
while the pandemic interrupted them and, and delayed them, um, we've seen in places like British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, even in Ontario with the implementation of the online learning graduate or the e-learning graduation requirement, um, basically a lot of these review processes or um, new ecosystems that were going to be new regulatory environments that were going to be put in place um, either in the 2022 23 school year or starting with the 23 24 school year those program you know those processes have actually concluded now um, so we're actually seeing the implementation of those things uh, this year and in many jurisdictions although not all um, we're seeing a, a general movement more towards centralized services and programs, which is interesting because if we were to go back eight to 12 years ago, um, it was the exact opposite. You saw a number of jurisdictions that were, and I should actually even more than eight to 12 years, if we were to go say anywhere from 20 years to the last eight years, we saw more of a movement of ministries of education and governments devolving a lot of these provincial programs onto the backs of school boards, districts, and divisions. And in the last really five years, we've started to see a movement back towards that centralization. Um, although obviously there are some outliers on all of these points uh, going forward. So again, the report is available and all this information is available uh, on the website. And um, if you have any questions, uh, that's my contact information and Randy can drop his into the uh, chat. And uh, we've got tons of time for questions, comments and conversation. And I'll stop sharing now uh, just so I can see everybody again. All right, so thank you, uh, Michael, and and also Randy, and it's been busy in the chat. Um, so yes, we are open now to questions, uh, comments. Um, you can post them in the chat, or you can grab the microphone. We're not a big group here, so feel free just to grab the microphone and speak up. I I was interested in that uh, movement you're describing there towards the end there, uh, Michael. Um, towards greater centralization, because I do remember um, that move in, in British Columbia specifically for me um, from the centralized program that they had originally developed as a pilot. Um, and then they they broke it apart, sending it out to all the districts um, and the districts were handling it all in various, various ways. And it was. Um, I don't know, from from my perspective, it seemed a little bit chaotic, so I'm wondering if you you've picked up on any reasons why they're moving back to this centralized system? Um, well, I think it depends upon the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, it is interesting to note that the places where they have moved to a more centralized model have tended to be uh, small C conservative governments. Although that's not necessarily a pattern because Alberta is a small C conservative government um, and they've gone the exact opposite way. They got rid of the one centralized program that they had, um, whereas, you know, the the small L liberal government uh, that was there seemed to be somewhat supportive of that centralized program. Um, and by the same token, we've had. Uh, if you look at Nova Scotia as an example, they made most of their movements to a centralized program um, when it was a small L liberal government there because they originally started with district based programs. Um, so while I can't say that that's, a, you know, that small C conservatives move that way, it is interesting to note that the the two juris the, the three jurisdictions that have gone most wholeheartedly in that were some of the more vocal conservative governments uh, in the Ford government and the um, the, the Saskatchewan party government. Um, and I think in both cases, they went in different ways. Um, like if you look at Saskatchewan, they created a crown corporation, um, actually essentially taking one of the district-based programs and anointing them as the crown corporation um, to provide it. And they were the largest um, one of the largest uh, districts provided. Um, in the case of Ontario, they took what was the Independent Learning Centre, which was operated by, you know, TVO, Television Ontario, 
um, which is an arm's length agency of the government um, that uh, has been operating distance learning there for over a century. And their rationale for doing that uh, at the time was, I would say, somewhat ideological in the fact that you had um, a goal of essentially selling Ontario education to the world. Um, and that, that was stated in many of the, the things that they had. They didn't use it quite that way, but they would talk about the ability to, um, you know, uh, make a profit from folks outside of Ontario that could be used to help offset the cost of education for folks inside of Ontario. And if that's how the funding was being used, I think that's wonderful. And that's a great idea. If we can sell Ontario curriculum to folks in, in Saudi Arabia and in, in China and places like that, and you know, use the money generated from that to, you know, keep a music program in northern Ontario, or to to you know offer additional foreign language courses to folks throughout the the, the rural parts of Ontario. That's great. Um, if it's being used to line the the coffers of of government for other purposes, or being spun off, what we're seeing now with the large increase in private school programs. Uh, being spun off as a revenue generator for private interests, that's a completely different uh, issue. Um, so I, I, I can't, don't think there's necessarily trends nationally. I think if we were to drill into why it's happening in certain jurisdictions, I think we could probably, uh, you know, figure out why that's happening. Um, you, know, you mentioned British Columbia is a good example. You know, they went from, what was it, six or eight distance education, regional distance education schools, yeah. Randy, um, you know, to at one point, like 75 um, different programs. It got back down to about 60 uh, or so public programs. And while they all had the ability to operate at a provincial level, um, a lot didn't. A lot only operated with their district or with their district in a neighboring district that they had partnered together to form the program in the first place. Um, so I think the, the that was that was largely. If I, I can interrupt, Mike, that was largely driven <laughs> by the fact that the funding model uh, allowed for uh, per course funding for even districts that had students coming in, and they changed the policy and the model so that those are just operating for students within their district. They just get funding just for in district. They don't get additional funding for doing uh, this online. So hence the term blended really doesn't apply in those situations. But they just cannot enroll students and fund them outside of their district. Yeah, and and those changes I think really were just putting onto paper what was actually happening on the ground anyway um, to clarify the regulations. Because for those, if I was a district that me and the the district next door decided to partner to create one online school and we're just doing it for our own programs and we're not enrolling anybody else in the province. It creates a whole heck of a lot of paperwork to have to do all of this, you know, distributed learning stuff to whereas we're only dealing with students in our own district anyway. Yeah, and, and it, it essentially the, they centralized just to try to simplify their funding formula and make it a little bit more uh, and the and to increase the accountability. There was a lot of school districts which they really didn't know what the practice was or if it was quality and effective and they were still drawing some funding and they felt the responsibility for it so they tried to consolidate it the intent and the goal that bc had in the ministry when they started it was to get to four or five possibly six while they ended up with a lot more than that <laughs> so uh, currently there's 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 18 boards but uh I'm sorry, get, let me get this right. It's 21 programs, I think it was basically, and 16 independents. So they've got a larger group of 30 programs that are operating provincially, but they, I guess they feel that they can have a reasonable amount of control and feedback uh, and data follow-up within that group. I mean, in terms of public pronouncements, one of the things we often hear about jurisdictions that are centralized in these things, it's about economies of scale when you're looking at the services. Um, you know, as an example, in, in, in BC, um, each of the, the online programs would select their own learning management system, which meant that they had to, you know, if they were getting a, you know, one that they had to pay for, would have to go to the company and sign their own agreement based on X number of students. 
if you have the province that's negotiating that contract, obviously the X is exponentially higher, which means the cost per student should be somewhat lower. And jurisdictions like Ontario have been, and for that matter, all of Atlantic Canada have been doing that for an actually Manitoba as well, have been doing that for decades where they've negotiated those contracts at the provincial level to provide some cost savings um, in terms of the overall per cost student on those programs. Uh, the other that we often hear, although doesn't usually materialize, although did in Ontario was one of the, the few success stories we've had that is the duplication of resources. Um, you know, if there's well, you saw some most of those provinces, 20 or 30 or 40 programs. Every single one of them likely has a math nine course. Every single one of them has, you know, a social studies 10 course um, or even if half of them do. That means that, you know, of those 40 programs, you've got 20 teachers that have gone in and created content for a math nine course. Um, and depending upon their technical abilities, they may or may not, you know, that that content may be good, but it might not be all that good. Um, you know, having a single version of those that have been created by somebody who is, you know, who has been vetted to be skilled in those areas um, also, you know, is a better use of resources. And one of the things we often see touted, uh, although the only place where it really happened uh, with any measure of success was in Ontario. So it just just to further elaborate a bit on that individual programs and individual teachers creating content, the reality was this, that that was not effective pedagogy that resulted. And a lot of the schools started to organize around a consortium model so that the consortium would support each other to have more centralized development of courses, et cetera. So uh, and and or they would negotiate a, a, a if they purchased it from a, a, a supplier or a, a company, uh, they would negotiate sort of a contract con contract agreement, but it would be paid by individual districts. So they were still managing together. And that's how the Ontario e-learning consortium started to work with uh, and started to evolve as well, even though that the provincial ministry also hired teachers in the summer to write curriculum for their online programs. And in British Columbia, it was done uh, collectively by the districts, not coordinated by the ministry. And at times, obviously, in Alberta, it was centrally done. Other times, it was done by through consortia. It's the same message for the LMS before it was provincially negotiated. There was agreement between and amongst districts that they're going to work with Moodle. And Moodle was the choice for many of those K-12 districts at the time. Now, under provincial negotiations, is typically it's shifting towards Brightspace, D2L's Brightspace. Okay, so uh, 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 a good mix there of uh, both the ideological and the and the pragmatic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Michelle, did, did you, you were smiling at a couple of comments. I don't know whether you have anything yeah. you want to add. Go ahead, take the mic. Sorry, were you asking Michael or me? No, oh. the chat. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm smiling. I work in the uh, post-secondary arena. I've had no experience in K-12. Um, and I'm an instructional designer in Saskatchewan. I live in Nova Scotia. Um, so all of this is highly entertaining, um, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I am interested. I've never read the report or delved into this, but uh, um, you know what you're what you're tracking and looking at. But I'm wondering about um, student demographics. If that is uh, part of the report, do we look at why in Saskatchewan and Alberta and BC we've got such a high uh, percent? Is that um, is, does that have to do with the demographics, uh, demographics, geographics, um, or political? Uh, Thank you. So I'm um, wondering about if, if you get into the whys and any more of that. Uh, we haven't because we really there hasn't been a centralized way of capturing that data. And it would be something we would have to get on a program by program basis uh, because it's not collected by the ministries. In fact, many of them, even if we were to ask for like a gender breakdown, wouldn't be able to provide that. 
Um, well, in, in some cases, the ministries aren't even able to provide the exact number of students that are learning at a distance. So uh, asking for any sort of demographic information about them uh, would be near impossible. Um, so, I, I mean, in terms of generally speaking, um, historically, distance learning has usually been used in the rural areas as a way of supplementing curriculum that wasn't available in, in their schools. Um, and I would, while I don't have data to support this, you know, my, um, I guess, 26 years in the field now, um, suggests that that's probably still the main reason why you you see distance learning uh, occurring, um, although not strictly just for rural areas now, uh, because there's a lot of you know larger city schools that still can't offer a course say in Mandarin, or an advanced placement something or other, um, even though they've got a lot of students, they just don't have enough students that are interested in that you know specific subject uh, able to offer it, or if it is offered. It's often offered at a time when students of that type would be engaged in other types of things. So they have to make a choice between, you know, do I do this AP course in the classroom or do I do this AP course online? Um, you know, and many of them would make the the in the classroom option on that, um, even though they're interested in both you know, the chemistry course as well as the biology course um, type thing. Uh, so Beyond that, um, in recent years, we, we've seen a number of students, and by recent years, I mean since the pandemic, uh, we have seen a growing number of students that are, are opting for distance learning uh, for health reasons, um, and not just physical health reasons, but mental health reasons as well. Um, I suspect that a lot of them, when they got some exposure or experience to it, through the pandemic, while the pandemic based remote learning might not have been a good experience, they started to learn about other options that were available out there for them. And for a lot of these students, once you remove the the impediments in their brick and mortar schools that are preventing them from having success that have nothing to do with academics at all. Um, you know, things like, you know, being bullied or or just the inability to sit in desks in rows facing the front with the teacher in the, you know, for a 60 minute period. Uh, you know, you remove those sort of barriers and all of a sudden the student thrives. Um, so we've seen a, a number of students, a growing proportion of students that, that would fall into those categories. And that's a, a worldwide trend, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I, I just got back from New Zealand and um, doing a, we're starting a similar study to this there, and uh, they have three health, three regional health schools that provide distance learning, and um, they estimate now that somewhere between um, the lowest estimate I heard from one of them was two thirds of their students. The highest estimate I heard was eighty percent of their students uh, were enrolled with them for what they considered mental health reasons. Um, and uh, their numbers are increasing usually about 10 to 15 percent year over to year uh, in terms of, of the number of students they're servicing and they're almost all coming from that particular category. Um, beyond that, I mean, I'm sure there are some out there that you know, our homeschooling students that that don't like public education that are enrolling in this option, although that's a smaller number than what you would think, because many of the the vast majority of opportunities you have to learn at a distance are operated by public school districts. So in many cases, those homeschooling students that are homeschooling because for religious reasons or just they don't like public education um, aren't choosing distance learning as an option because the only free options are still operated by public schools. Uh, so that would be a small uh, number there. Um, I don't know, Randy, if, if as you've been interacting with folks, if there are other trends you're seeing in terms of who's enrolling or why they're enrolling. Well, yeah, I think to a certain extent, ge ge geography plays a, a large part, certainly in, in Western uh, Canada, Northern Ontario and other places. Uh, but policies also define and restrict uh, or encourage um, what happens and who can enroll and how it's funded. Uh, so that's where you see the variances in terms of the the uptake uh, for that. BC's probably had more progressive funding over the past while, 
um, for for a lot of the programs. But as well, what happens in school districts is they the the online school was used to be the correspondence school. It was the school of last resort. So a lot of students were just tossed in there. They weren't successful in a, in a brick and mortar setting with counseling and supports. They just threw them online to do correspondence and then th thought that would be, you know, a success, or at least that's the only place where they could put them. But as as the the uh, K to twelve learning uh, matured, it became much more better pedag pedagogically. Those schools started to resist and push back at them because it wasn't a good placement. And then the ministries and, and government started to look at as well quality uh, perspectives around the success of students and uh, as well. So they just became a much more defined area like how in, originally in online programs in post-secondary, uh, the, what the early versions were were not necessarily that very that that good, but now they have really uh, stepped up uh, based on a lot of the work that's been done by researchers around studying and what you're doing, Michelle, in terms of your your instructional design. So you're trained, you understand what works in that particular environment, which is why remote learning failed so terribly because teachers did not have any skill basis or understanding about how to work within that particular environment. Uh, that's a long-winded answer to a question that you asked that was quite simple. It, it wasn't long-winded because it's not a simple issue. Um, <laughs> and, and so, I mean, just like I say, my experience is in the post-secondary arena. And um, uh, this is just, I came today to start to think about the K-12 world. Um, and even just uh, who, when you talk about funding, I'm assuming you mean funding on the uh, at the institution or program or um, uh, the you know the, the the provider level, but also from the student level is is there is that an issue as well? Like how do students? Um, I guess in every province it's different how students determine or are able to determine whether they can pursue distance education and. Um, whether it's what you're talking about public and private, I hadn't even thought of that, I'll be quite honest. So this is just a whole different arena for me. So lots of questions. But. Yeah, so the, the funding aspect, and with the exception of Ontario and British Columbia and Alberta, where there are um, specific provisions put in place for funding of distance learning or funding related to distance learning. Every other jurisdiction, distance learning in terms of a funding mechanism isn't factored into it. So they just fund, you know, a per student rate. Um, and it's the same for distance learning students as it is for um, brick and mortar students because there's no distinction in the, like, they don't use the term distance learning in the regulatory language at all. So it just talks about this is the per student funding. So online programs have to sort of figure out what does that mean for us? Uh, because oftentimes like there's a tenants requirements and truancy and when is a student officially considered a role, all those types of things that in a distance environment look different than what they would in a brick and mortar environment. But the legislation treats it all as one big thing. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, if you, if like you might have a, a truancy you know regulation that talks about you know if you have missed x number of days over the past y number of days what does that look like when you're talking about a distance environment um with a brick it might talk about you know a student is officially enrolled in the course well what's an official enrollment in a brick and mortar school they actually the you know they they show up to the the school and 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 enroll their child and their child starts actually physically attending the school what does that look like in the case of an online school and it's only um British Columbia uh, that actually really has any guidelines around this. Uh, in the case of Alberta, they just all of their pockets of funding. So they break down their their funding per student based around all these different categories. So you might get some for um, like busing and transportation. You might get some for sporting equipment. You might get some for X and Y and Z and distance students don't qualify for some of those pots. Um, so if you have students that are enrolled at a distance, you don't get, for example, the busing funding. Um, you might not get the janitorial funding uh, for them because there's assumption they're not in the school. 
in the case of Ontario, the only distinction is that there is a, uh, a, a regulatory line that talks about how if you are serving a student from outside of your district, you are supposed to, or outside of your board, you're supposed to charge the board that the student is in a certain fee. Uh, but these consortiums that Randy just mentioned uh, have decided that, well, that's an awful lot of paperwork that I'm going to send Michelle you know, this year uh, a bill for so many, but Michelle's also going to send me a bill for so many, and I'm going to send Dan the same bill, you know, so on and so on. It's a lot easier for us just to say, okay, let's just assume that over the span of the next five years, this is just going to be a wash, so we're not going to bother with charging anybody that. Well, the, the consortium does have a, 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 fis, a the fiscal model. It's, it's in there as well. But Michelle, the other thing is, is that while the Ministry of Education may fund a school board or district, it doesn't mean necessarily that that school that's operating as a distance learning or online school gets all of that funding. So there's the quality issue is 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 it varies depending on the actual allocation of money from the school districts. And again, as they were in the past, the schools of last resort for students, they were also the schools that got the, the leftovers in terms of funding in many cases in districts. That is shifting with the attention to and the progression of online learning. Anyway, I'm also looking at the time and I know Dan, you're probably thinking about the time. Yeah. I just have one point to add to that. You mentioned actually about the ability to access this, and that's an important one because one of the jurisdictions that is an outlier in a lot of these is Quebec. Um, you know, the proportion of students that they have compared to the proportion of distance learners. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because actually by their 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 public education law or the public instruction law, um, distance learning services are only available to students in on sec the, the exact language is exceptional and unforeseen circumstances or special home and hospitalized teaching services. So unlike other jurisdictions where they actually somewhat encourage or at least permit students to enroll in distance learning options, it, it is very difficult to for a student to enroll in these unless you've got an actual school board that is promoting this kind of thing, or the student just drops out of the public education system at the age of 16 altogether, then they can enroll otherwise. Um, so in the case of Quebec, they're really restricting this access and they're really the only jurisdiction that's doing that and it's worth mentioning that because you did raise the issue of ability to access so and i know we're at the top of the hour and i know dan you've got about 30 to 60 seconds of, of stock that you've got to do so i will turn it back to you sure uh okay so yes i just want, really want to say thank you um to our presenters today uh, michael barbour and randy levante uh, Michael Barber from Turo University in California and Randy Labonte from uh, Canny Learn. Uh, I see Randy, you've put your email address in the chat. Um, so if you if there are any other follow up questions or if you're watching this on the recording and have any follow up questions uh, and there you go, Michael has also put his in the chat as well. Uh, yeah, just uh, I mean, just reach out either to them or to me and I'll make sure that any questions get passed along. And again, if uh, if you are a researcher and you are interested in presenting in a CIDR session, um, contact me. Uh, you can find uh, that contact information at our site, ciderresearch.ca, C-I-D-E, research.ca, um, and, uh, and you'll find a recording of this session posted there a bit later on today. And I thank you to our, our small but, uh, but uh, very welcome audience. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Austin. Yes, thank you, everyone. And uh, I don't mind hanging out for a few minutes after Dan turns off the recording. If folks have questions or, or comments yeah, that they want to raise well. that aren't captured in the um, in the um, in the formal session, I've got to run. <laughs>